I took my first drink at 10. My cousin and I were crawfishing. And I kept hounding for beer and he said, okay, you gotta drink the whole thing. And I did and it, and it hit my belly like it was, it was uh, utopia. You know, I was 10 years old, but already full of fear and instability. So John Michael, how old are you? I'm 52. And where are you from? I'm from Poverty Point. <laughs> no, I'm from uh, like the northeast part of the state. So it's Louisiana. called Poverty Point, yes. And you're here in New, New Orleans? This is home, this is my holy Mecca. How long have you been here? Started to reside here more after Katrina, more and more um, working, but like living, um, five or six years, I think. Okay. Some sporadic, you know, um, I have daughters and a son in Shreveport as well as my mother and then their mothers uh, in Shreveport. So, um, you know, I spent some time there, but we don't, I don't blend in well in Shreveport, to say the least, so this is home. Yeah. Is that mic on? Uh, is it? Yep. Yeah. Okay, I me? didn't see the green light. Oh, it's on the other side. So, um, how did you get down here? Mm. How, how are you here under this uh, highway? It is not so complicated like you would think. Um, it uh, kind of boils down to, you know, the um, lack of days gratitude of, of, of being an addict, all right? Coupled with some legal problems. And then, well, I, my first wife's father was uh, a bandito. Uh, fat Mexican. He was an MC. He was chapter president of that area, and they couldn't stand him. So naturally, they couldn't stand me or my son, who's in prison now. But um, I went up there to visit my daughters, me and my girl, and uh, I went into Home Depot because I was going to do a little work while I was there, a couple weeks. Uh, put some stuff on hold at the uh, what you call the desk help, whatever the desk is. And when I walked out, they surrounded me and charged me with attempted felony robbery, which was, I was plotting to set stage a robbery in the Home Depot. So I did six months of jail time because they set my bond at damn near $100,000 on that charge and nobody I knew had that. And so I lost everything uh, waiting to get to court. Mm -hmm. When I got to court, I had it thrown out in five minutes, but mm -hmm. they naturally still have a disdain for me and my son and and his grandfather who no longer wears that patch but it's funny like um and I, i'm not blaming that i'm just saying I, I was put into an atmosphere to where um you know i had an opponent mm -hmm. there in that city and uh, fortunately i leased the house from a federal drug court judge who afforded me some um some avenues to stay uh and I, so from that from that point on, I try to stay away from there. But that's how I got here. It was when I came out of there, I had no car, no apartment. My clothing was gone. Basically, just had the clothes I went in there with that stink. They they uh, vacuum seal them for you, and on the way out, they give them to you. So still stink, huh? Uh, yeah, I, I realized, man, you got to do something. And so I left up there. Being homeless up there was very difficult it's a different kind of place We're harder than here much yeah much. so you had mentioned addiction and drug court what is your drug of choice it's been it's been everything uh i took my first drink at 10. um my cousin and i were crawfishing and i kept hounding for beer and he said okay you gotta drink the whole thing and i did and it, and it hit my belly like it was it was uh Utopia, you know, I was 10 years old, but already full of fear and instability. I was raised by an alcoholic father, a mother who was in a sanitarium. And, you know, um, I spent a lot of time in taverns. I could mix a turkey and coke by the time I was 11, 12 years old, hmm. whatever. So I grew up in that Louisiana culture. Around 14, 15, I started to uh, lean toward drugs because I kept getting in trouble drinking, right? And, um, 
you know, 15, 16, I'm dropping acid and mushrooms and smoking weed every day before, you know. I was in full flight from reality from the very start. Like, I look back, I used to steal quarters and go play video games to be in full flight from reality when I was a kid before I figured out. Before you figured out drugs. Before I figured out substances. So, so you think that you've been uh, addicted to escaping reality? I self-medicating. Self-medicating is a better word. Early on, full fight from reality. Later on, self-medicating for, you know, uh, friendlier skies, you know, less turbulence, better seats, you know. Mm -hmm. I, um, uh, 1989, crack cocaine invaded, like, the neighborhood I lived in. And so my whole generation, like, we were... I, I was um, helping sell it on the streets and started using it. We would get rewarded or paid in crack every night. And we had no idea what we were messing with. But in 19, I think, yeah, 19 or 20, I, I tried to go to California, join the service, but guess what? They had plenty of crack out there too. So, mm. you know, I ended up in the brig and that, Addiction ran its course right through my soul for about 25 years. Crack cocaine? Crack, crack and cocaine. But, you know, once you smoke cocaine, like it's, Never it's odd that you're gonna just snort and not wanna go back to, mm -hmm. because it just, um, well, back then, I mean, it was, the war on drugs was happening. Mm -hmm. uh, the cocaine um, potency was extremely high, higher than it is now. And it was so prevalent on the streets, anywhere in Louisiana, that they were fighting each other in order to sell it to you. Mm. So, um, it really, you know, I, I, not so much then we didn't see, but now I see how much it affected us because it's showing up late in the game, the effects of, you know, you know, continual adrenaline shots to your brain. Like my limbic system is stuck on turbo you know, and then that exacerbated bipolar mania that runs in my family. So have you been diagnosed? Oh yeah. Yeah, I'm a, uh, man, I'm a uh, permanent housing certified. I've been all over, I'm a veteran. Still don't have a house. Why? You tell me, I would like to know, but I'm just before, um, I'm just before, you know, just causing a scene and finding out what in the world do I have to do. I've been out here going on three years. I've done everything y'all asked me to do, except maybe you couldn't find me when you came to look for me because, hell, you hadn't looked for me in months. So, you know, that, that they've used that as an excuse not to, mm -hmm. you know. And I'm not asking for special favors. I just need four walls and a roof to stabilize. Well, yeah, it's really like do. a pretty reasonable ask. That's, man, I know me and I know what I have to have. And you can't, you, I'm not saying you can't, but it is quite a challenge to do it out here. Are you, so are, do you still use drugs? Yeah, I just shot yeah. a big spoon full of uh, amphetamines I don't know, an hour ago, maybe. So now, so now you're not using crack anymore? You, you shoot methamphetamine? You rarely use crack unless I'm you know, um, serving some customers who are usually older clientele because that was our generation. I'm 52. Most of my friends are a little older. It, it really affected my generation. Sure. Um, and it's showing up now. You can go down the bridge and look. And the people you see that, you know, are on toward, you know, that age and up, uh, those are your, those are typically your crack addicts. And they don't want anything else. Like, that's... So occasionally, if I'm in that place, I'll, I'll do a little, but it doesn't even touch what we had. And yeah, yeah. What we had would make you very quiet, sit down, shut up, slobber, and then want more. <laughs> and you didn't care what it took to get it. You just wanted more. It was insane. So that's why. With meth, I always thought that meth was like an extreme uh, upper, right? And, hmm. and so you seem you, you seem think. very calm. You seem like you're very yeah. well put together. You're speaking well. How is is you is your tolerance just really high, and you can manage it, or how hey, do you think that I've, is? I've worked hard to lower it recently. I've really been working hard, and um, well, you know what it is with me. Like a lot of us out here, you'll you'll find we have more of um, a um, out of what was it abstract type mind. 
And so substances, a lot of times, will affect us just the opposite or different. Kind of quiet it down a little bit? Um, yeah, if you've already got quite a, an amperage going on, a lot of times those stimulants, like a Ritalin for a kid, stimulants will tone you down. Mm. I don't have that, but I've just learned how to medicate myself. Okay. You know, and I had to get away from heroin and crack. It was a taskmaster that continued to wreak havoc. So I let that go. But in order to let it go, I latched onto that and it has had its own demons. But, you know, overall, I'm better than I ever have been. And on my way to, um, I was sober 10 years, you know, 10, wow. years, 10 whole years, like clean and sober. And uh, right after Katrina, I picked up. I don't know that I've been sober a day since, to tell you the truth. Do you think Katrina had something to do with, with, uh, uh, with you picking up? Nah, no. it just created an environment where it made it plausible because I think what happened was I, I was I'm a plumber, I have my own business. And I was doing something, a piece of little a little tiny piece of iron went in my eye. But I took a lower tab. And that's the first real substance I'd had in mm -hmm. this was around year eight. So it didn't happen right away, but for that next year it just slowly was nipping on me. Mm -hmm. And then one night I was out of town, man. I don't know, I just went through the liquor store drive through got a 12-pack of Miller Lite, and an hour later I had an eight ball of cocaine on the table in the hotel. And that was the beginning of, it's like I had never stopped. So yeah. Do you think, I hear that all the time, that when people get clean and sober, they might stay off of their drug of choice, but then they eventually will go back to like maybe having a drink or something? Do you think that alcohol so, can lead people back so, to their drugs? I know me, it doesn't matter like if, look, if buttons got me high, man, it wouldn't be a shirt safe. I got me snatching. Like, it didn't matter. Like, whatever I'm, whatever substance I would use, I know how to use it and derive what I'm trying to get from it. But so I, I, I wouldn't say, I would, I'm not, I don't like laying the blame on stuff like that because it absolves us from our own response. If I wanted to, I could put in the hard work. I've got friends in sobriety here, I've been sober, I used to sleep on my couch like pin cushions, all right? But now they're sober and I'm not. Yeah. Um, Dave, I just saw one the other day. He's a famous jockey here, or was. Oh, he was, he was a cracked addict for years. We blew so much of his winning on cocaine, but he's sober now and I went to see him. I could go there, but I just don't have, um, I don't have that real desire, willingness to live a sober life. I just want harm reduction, you know, and I've gained that um, slowly, real slowly. But So there's important. a part of you that in, enjoys being out here, right? Not necessarily being out here, but I, what comes with being out here? I'm kind of a baby, man, a, a bit of a um, softy, so I like my luxuries. And, you know, I don't like the hard aspect of the street, but what I do love is the connection with um, Uncommon, you know? And I mean, I was kind of raised in the streets myself, so I, I resonate with it. it mm -hmm. You know, I'm not an aggressive person by any means, I'm more of a gypsy, but I like to move around and collect, you know, experiences or make memories, not so much money anymore. So I is did. it safe to say that if you could like if you could wave a magic wand, what would that life look like? Would it include yeah. the luxuries, but still having the drugs too? The drugs is just what I do. It's just part of me. It's probably what I'll do till I die, um, but not harmful, because I kicked heroin. I died 20 times on heroin. You could ask Tulane or UMC, they both, neither one of them wanted to see me coming. One would try to push me off on the other, but I hadn't done that. Matter of fact, I did do that on Mardi Gras just this past by keep up in some coke, it was fitting all, all in it. Matter of fact, I just went and got test strips. Anyhow, I've come a long way. I was in a tent down there by the Iberville, the old food stamp office, and I rarely came out at daylight because I didn't, I was in a nod. I was, I was not here <laughs> and I don't do that anymore. I don't have a death wish. I have a zeal for life, I generally wake up excited, but I love people, mm. you know, so. When I was clean and sober, I had an encounter with what I call God, and it kind of broke something in me that had me bound. 
and the result was that, you know, um, it drew me to, uh, well, these are people that move me with compassion, most of these people out here, even the nasty ones. So that's, that's really my drug of choice is people connection yeah connection you right. mentioned the nasty ones even the nasty ones i would imagine that you know everybody kind of fending for themselves out here living in tents is a some somewhat difficult lifestyle or it can mm. be yes, are, there some, are there some terrible things that you've seen out here uh, yeah can yeah you, can you name a couple of those oh man um seeing people get shot you know, um, seem just beat bloody. Like, <sighs> there's a lot of confusion, but it breeds desperation, can breed selfishness. And then that can get extreme when you add, you know, a raging habit for narcotics. Heroin will make you get up and go get it whatever way you can because the marrow inside your bones is crying out in pain. At least your brain's saying that. And until you get that off your back, you can't even think about it. You can't even fathom anything. You can't fathom going to get breakfast. You've got to get well. Like, and that's taking a toll on our city. Like this city is so beautiful, but like, I mean, look, and this is everywhere, everywhere. There's not a part of the city where this isn't going on, even uptown. Do the dealers just bring the drugs right to you? Some of them do. Yeah, you don't Most have to. of the cats you'll see out here hustling on the street are out here hustling to survive, and they also either have a habit or know somebody close to them with a habit. Mm -hmm. So, or they grew up with a mother and a father with a habit. And those are the stories that you would not believe. Mm -hmm. Like, how did you even make, like, but you know what? All that being said, some of the most amazing people I meet out here that are patient, tolerant, and high-minded, like they really do think for them while they're doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you gotta do that. You got yeah. like, I know that's my call and to, um, to just um, be the best I can be. So that I'm a good father, but you know, my mother, my grandmother, they always, they taught us how to give. Like, mm -hmm. and that was the key to life was to, uh, help others or serve others, you know, I guess you could say, serving others, so. So, now that we know a little bit about you, sure. what would be, uh, if you could wave a magic wand today, and you immediately inject yourself into into the perfect life that's perfect for you, what would Ooh, that, what would It that wouldn't take much, like? man. Tell me what that is. First one would be my son coming home on parole from Angola. He's only 30, and, you know, I feel, somewhat responsible. I was clean a lot of his life, but his grandfather uh, with a motorcycle club, me not being clean. And, you know, he became a gangster young and he's doing gangster shit now in Angola. Uh, for uh, He's been hit three or four times for distributions and he always had a gun close by, so. And, you know, he got out and he was only out three months and he went back on purpose, mm. on purpose. He's only 30, but um, I don't know. I don't know why yet. I would say him being out. This one here, uh, that's Olivia. She was two there, she's 14 now. And then my youngest, Bella, her mother doesn't really allow me to talk to her right now because I'm not clean and sober. But what I would need to happen is that I would need to either A, lease or B, purchase a residence that I could, you know, I can restore any of these houses except for the roof, but I would just like that opportunity to create a um, a place for my daughters, um, and then I would like some kind of you know vehicle that runs. That's all I don't care about. That runs that would get me there and back, because I can get up there in four and a half, five hours, spend the weekend with my girls, check on my mama, and come back. Like that right there, just those things would um that would be perfect because i could build on that from, i mean there's I, I don't want anything else like that is what i want um i've been in relationships beautiful women amazing women and then with another amazing woman who's also an addict 
and they've all been addicts. And, and what's weird is they're all cancers. Two of them with the same birthday, man. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't even try. I don't even know any of that. I'm just saying there's patterns that seem to be mm -hmm. in the um, in my lineage. Like it's it, it's second nature sometimes to just um, think the way I think or, you know, um, but one thing I don't have anymore is that full flight from reality. Like I really, you know, I do get loaded, but I mean, you can see, I just, I really engage with people. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, that's when I'm whole, I'm whole. Like that's what fixes me. Like when I can uh, be serving in some capacity, you know, and I've come a long way. I had a brain injury uh, from Abilify, I had a couple of strokes. I got hot shotted. Somebody tried to poison me, uh, take my stuff in my car. It's crazy. And then police were coming in the house one time and I ate everything in my pockets. And that put me in the hospital. So mm -hmm. I've taken some some hits. Mm -hmm. I don't do what I used to do as quick, but You're still I'm here. here. Man. I'm here. I'm alive and I'm happy. And I just want to. Um, we're in a strange time on the earth, man. Man's heart's waxing cold. Like, if you look around, it really is waxing cold. So I just try to be the antithesis to that in some way. If I got to cuss somebody out for, you know, throwing some garbage at, you know, some girl laying on Bourbon Street who obviously can't get up, you know, um, whatever. Or uh, just looking for the next open door to do something value, I, you know. To me, we're God's favorite piece in the whole ensemble is mankind. So, I mean, it's the best place to invest. Yeah. I was in business, I did all that, I made a million dollars of business in one year, and guess what? I was slap miserable, full of stress, and I had a cocaine habit out of this world. Out of this world. I was trying to run my plumbing business from my hotel room, mm -hmm. you know, over the phone while I'm, I got three pipes, they're all clogged up. Because mm -hmm. I had enough money to do it like I wanted to do it, and it, I, it was it was killing me. It was killing me, and I, I would have psychotic breaks and just disappear, you know. And so, so money can't buy happiness, huh? It didn't buy me shit except a lot of frustration, a lot of, a lot of and damn near killed me. Yeah, that's what that bought me big old cookies. It was ridiculous. And I tell you what, there's no worse feeling than being hijacked by your own self, and you can't do anything about it. Mm. You just can't make yourself go in off the street. You know your feet hurt and you've been walking, stinking in the same clothes. It's been three days. But there's something in you that just will not abide with, hey, let's let's do something here uh, a little a little better than this. Yeah. Try to be. Let's rest for a minute. Let's yeah, take a nap. Something, take a shower. Anything. Let's eat. eat. Yeah. I'm underweight now down. because you know, I, I went through a breakup not long ago and I really got, like I've always been with pretty much three months I'm codependent. I got a lot of issues like that, but it really threw me for a loop and I really went after it hard for a few months. So I'm just really shaking back. I went and got a job today um, working for a hotel over here. The lady really needed me. So, and I walked in and she had just fired the guy this morning. And so timing is, there's no coincidences in time and space, not in my life at all. Uh, you would blow your mind sometimes the miracles. The stuff that happens like cannot be explained mm -hmm. other than divine providence. And that's why I love New Orleans. You know? well, I mean, it will chastise you, don't get me wrong, but it will love you to death too. It's just beautiful. When we're talking about uh, perfect timing, if someone's watching this video today and they hear yeah. you with yeah. one message for the world, what would that message be? Man, I guess don't judge yourself by through your own eye or what you see in the mirror, you know? And don't worry about what anybody thinks about you. Just try to love them as purely as you can and you'll be at peace. And loving yourself is not easy when you have um, an, an addiction. Some, pe some of the people I meet out here, they hate themselves. But today I love myself, like solidly love myself. I love being me. And I wasn't always like that. I was a prisoner in my own skin for a long time um, from a child for a lot of reasons. But trauma is a big factor. People that need healing out here, they need healing. And drugs don't heal. They just numb you long enough to get through the day. 
but they need healing and that takes connection. That's the antidote for me. That's, I think that's the answer, connection of whatever kind to help them go in there and find whatever broken kid or person is in there and bring them back up to the present moment. Like we can get so caught up in semantics of what it is and what it does and what, why this one's worse than the other. And none of that matters. We're just broken people who need, um, man, look, if they want, if it was an Olympic event, we'd be in the goal because some of the most resilient people I know live out here on these streets, even these women. That, that little girl over there is probably one of the smartest administrators I've ever seen, but all she needs is a break and some direction and somebody to help her to lay that out. She's never known it. But you see it, you see the talents in all these people. I just, I don't know, it just makes you love them even more when you see um, the uh, weaker side mm. of the personality. I mean, I can't say nothing, man. I, some, they were calling me Talkamo because I'm an Indian and I couldn't stop talking. I'd get manic and you could see I've slowed down a lot. I'm not dealing with near as much. I don't take any psychotropic drugs from the doctors. I smoke a lot of weed, do a little amphetamine, maybe drink a beer or two. That's come a long way from overdosing on the regular and ending up at Tulane. I just thank God for that. Like, and I thank Connections for that. It's really phenomenal people love me through the worst parts of my life. Really phenomenal. And so it's pretty amazing. Like, you, I could say this, you can't do it by yourself, I promise you. Mm. Nobody can do it by, you got to be connected to something and at least have a small circle to make it, I think, you know, and that's why recovery stuff works so well, because yeah. that's, that's what that's it's about, it's what it's about. <laughs> It's all about that. Well, I appreciate the connection that we made and the time absolutely, that we spent. Absolutely, absolutely. You, yeah. and I hope that everything works out and for you. Man. Like, and this is like, to, this is just, I've been just getting these little downloads and then, you know, I know all I'm waiting on is the video equipment and then learning how to edit and compile because the stories, it, it's gonna be amazing. I just, I just think, um, well, you know what? Being creative is mm -hmm. something that helped me a social worker cloak. You need a new hobby. I said, who are you telling? I know I need a new hobby. <laughs> so I'm trying to find one and that's the one that came up. Yeah. When I was locked up, it was words. That was my whole joke, yeah. words. And then it turned into connection. It's the antidote. I kept getting that. Like, what? What? Yeah. What are you talking about? And it's unfolded into that out here. Like, um, and now I'm glad I went to jail because it afforded me the time to sit still. It all happens for a reason, right? Everything happens for a reason. God don't waste nothing. Not a thing. Yep. Thank you so much for your time. Absolutely, man. Thank you all. Y'all are freaking amazing, man. <laughs> Thank you. Dude, like, yeah. Like, I love it when people are interested in, you know, the stuff that interests me. That's, it's great. I don't think man's heart is waxing near as co cold as we want to look at it. I, th I think we're going to see a... I hope a so. restoration. I hope so. I mean, a yeah, remnant. The whole a world. Remnant. The whole world. Maybe. I don't watch the news, but from what I hear, it's pretty crazy. I don't even go across these canals. I rarely leave this city. Uh, from what I hear, it's pretty crazy out there. So, yeah. So it is. So, so be careful, man. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Man, bless y'all. Bless y'all, man. Thank you for giving me that chance.